Dimensional engineering really plays a role in, in uh, guaranteeing product quality and consistency um, because we are seeing every part of the design, the manufacturing, and the metrology process. And we are overseeing all of that and combining them together. Each of those different silos has their own objective, and we try to make sure that, you know, that objective is uniform across all three. Dimensional engineering is critical, in my opinion, in all industries. Whether your volume is a single nuclear power plant that you're going to end up building, or you're trying to get a thousand Nerf guns out the door in a single day, it's all important to look at from a dimensional engineering perspective. Again, the fail case for the nuclear power plant might be a little bit more critical than you know, a hundred Nerf guns coming off the line that don't meet quality standards, but the need for someone overseeing this is still there. In my opinion, if you are manufacturing parts that end up going to an assembly, having a dimensional engineer oversee the design, the manufacturing, the metrology of that is critical to a quality product. So a lot of companies are trying to implement dimensional engineering into their manufacturing process as well as design process because again, we are overseeing a lot of these different fields. And one of the big problems, honestly, I'm seeing a lot of companies have is personnel. How do we find these dimensional engineers? Because it is a very niche field. And I think that um, one thing the dimensional engineering field could improve in is the onboarding process, the amount of people we have who understand this and are passing that knowledge along, the availability of kind of open information online, things like that. When we think about sustainability and we think about dimensional engineering, the key thing that I think about is waste. With dimensional engineering, we're trying to reduce waste to an acceptable level where we aren't a, over-tolerancing our parts so that we're actually, you know, maybe paying too much on a per-part basis, maybe using very expensive, maybe very uh, unsustainable processes to manufacture these parts. And B, again, we are trying to reduce waste. If we have a super wasteful pro process that ends up throwing away a lot of parts, then obviously that one's probably going to affect the company's bottom line, but also from a sustainability perspective, it's gonna kind of solve, solve both cases. So a dimensional engineering investigation should really be started as early as possible in the design process. Um, if the later you get into the design process, you might already have locators chosen, you might already have your datum selected, you might even already have your manufacturing processes selected. At that point, you're really hoping the dimensional engineer validates all the choices you made before you ask them about it. The earlier you can involve them, the more confident you can be, again, in that locator selection, in that datum selection, in that manufacturing process you plan to use before you've already committed a lot of time down that path. So gd and uh, called Geometric Dimensioning and Tolerancing is a language found on engineering drawings which communicates between design, manufacturing, and metrology what the critical features are. Um, so within gd &T, you have a lot of symbols, some letters showing up. So if you aren't familiar with it, you're gonna look at the drawing and not really understand what it's saying. But once you know what the gd &T is saying, you'll understand that it's a very clean way to explain what the crucial features are and how much imperfection I can accept in those features and still call that part a good part that is acceptable coming off the line. When we're talking about the dimensional engineer using a simulation or a modeling tool, we wanna to get involved as early as possible in the design process so that we can anticipate the problems that might come up during the manufacturing process. Now, but if we just stay in the design process section for a second here, we can talk about where that variation is coming from. A lot of companies 
are still using legacy GDT or legacy tolerances on their engineering drawings. And this, by legacy tolerances or legacy GDT, I mean that a company may have started making a tractor in the 1980s and they haven't had any problems with the tractor going together yet. And so they just keep putting the same thing on the drawing. And the problem with that is when we're talking about optimizing the actual tolerance or reducing cost, we might be over-engineering a lot of components on that tractor. No one ever validated that, for example, that hole needed to have a position of one. And a dimensional engineer through a modeling or simulation tool can tell you, actually, we can get away with a position of three on this hole. And then when we move that part to the manufacturing process, we might be able to utilize a cheaper manufacturing process because we no longer need that hole to be as perfect. We can accept more imperfection. And that optimization of tolerances is a real future facing issue in the dimensional engineering community. Some initial steps that a company can take to improve its dimensional engineering practices is to one, and I'm gonna continue saying this, get a dimensional engineer involved early. If you just go to your dimensional engineering department after you've already made all of your decisions about how the parts will locate, what datums you're gonna use, what manufacturing processes, again, you're hoping the math equation ends up solving in your favor at the end, instead of actually making educated decisions throughout the engineering process. Another thing that I would say about a company just getting started with the dimensional engineering process or trying to involve it uh, for the first time is that tightening a tolerance is always the most um, tempting solution because it's the simplest solution. Hey, we made the number smaller and now our final product is better, but it's not always the best solution. Uh, by tightening a tolerance, you've actually increased the cost of that part going forward because you probably have to select a different manufacturing process in order to meet that tighter tolerance. If you can find a way to change your datum selection, change your locators, change your nominal geometry to increase a gap that you're trying to make sure you hit, any of these solutions really don't add cost to the entire assembly. Sure, they're gonna add a little bit more time to the design process so we can validate these changes, but they might end up being a better solution at the end of the day than simply always saying the design is final, we just have to tighten a tolerance at this point. Some tools that a dimensional engineer can use to assist in the design manufacturing metrology areas um, are first of all, uh, the simulation tool offered by DCS called 3DCS, which runs Monte Carlo simulations, effectively a virtual twin model that we use to check how part level imperfections are going to affect our assembly level design requirements. And we try to use that first at the outset. From there, we end up going towards manufacturing. And when we're manufacturing, the parts are coming off the line and they go straight into a CMM or perhaps a zero touch solution such as the one offered by DW Fritz. Or again, they go into a CMM that could perhaps be programmed by Silma or Metrolog. These are a few of the products you could use to get that metrology data. That metrology data can then be fed into another product from DCS called QDM or Quality Data Management, which can take all of your measured data from all of your suppliers and you can get an idea for how well across the world you're performing at manufacturing these parts. Taking it one step further, we could even do what we call in dimensional engineering, close the loop and take that data from QDM back into the 3DCS model we started with. Initially, a 3DCS model has a few assumptions baked in about our process capabilities, how well we're creating that. Now we have that actual data. We started manufacturing it, and we can put that back into our initial 3DCS model and get a better idea for, you know, what we can actually expect um, from these assemblies as they go out there. So one piece of advice that I could give a manufacturer who's trying to year over year improve their dimensional performance is to involve a dimensional engineer early and involve a dimensional engineer 
often. Even if, let's say in 2023, let's say that we only involve the dimensional engineer during the design process. And even when we involved this dimensional engineer, they really only got involved towards the end of the design process. Well, now you have potentially a 3D model that you can use and understand how that year's design performed. You can use that model then better optimize your tolerances moving into 2024. So now your 2023 data is influencing next year's design choices. And then maybe the following year, we start having the dimensional engineer talk to design and manufacturing. The manufacturer says, you know, actually we can easily manufacture that hole with a tolerance of 0.5 using the exact same system as we currently have when we're trying to hit a position of one. And it wouldn't cost anything more to just update the drawing and put that on there. Well, now we started to improve. We have a better feel for what our actual manufacturing capability is. And then lastly, maybe we also involve the dimensional engineer with the metrology team. The dimensional engineer can now tell the metrology team where to actually measure these parts. The metrology team probably receives the part, probably receives an engineering drawing. They know what targets they're trying to hit for each of these features, but they don't know where on the features are actually critical to the assembly. So we can bring the dimensional engineer into there, and then we can also improve metrology. Lastly, with that measured data, we could potentially even bring that measured data back into the three-dimensional model that the dimensional engineer created at the start. And using that data, we can, first of all, validate the measures that we're seeing perhaps on the exterior of our design, but also there's going to be things on the interior once our assembly is complete that we can no longer measure and validate that it's performing well. So we can use, again, the three-dimensional model to validate those measures as well. I think that the future of dimensional engineering involving AI or artificial intelligence could potentially lead to an easier to use set of solutions for the dimensional engineer. Right now, a lot of the tools are very expert-based tools. So you really, to be a dimensional engineer and understand all of these tools is even more than a full-time job. So you end up needing a team of dimensional engineers. Each one is even a specialist at that in their specific segment of dimensional engineering. And so when we think about artificial intelligence, maybe making each of these tools easier to use, or maybe helping us with having these tools talk to each other a little bit better, I believe that that's where I can see artificial intelligence really improving the dimensional engineering process, in addition to several other things that you could do with artificial intelligence, going, going back to things like optimizing tolerances, things like datum selection. You can maybe test a number of different datums. Really, my mind goes a lot of different places when we think about artificial intelligence and how it could improve the dimensional engineering process. And that's really where I think the future is for dimensional engineering. Thank you.